Good morning and welcome to Liberty Christian Fellowship. Thank you for joining us to seek and worship God today. Our message is entitled, God's Good People Promote Good Governmental Authority and is based on Romans 13 verses 1 through 4 where Pastor hopes to clear up any confusion that God's preference is for government to be good as God defines good. Because Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Many Christians feel it is their duty to see that the government treats we the people according to the Ten Commandments. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your Bible, for the word that has brought us to where we are, and that we can um, not just stay where we are, but that we can grow up in you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for your word, and we thank you for this gathering, and we want to worship you in this. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
an awesome sentiment. Who am I in heaven but you? Amazing. Our judge has died for us. Our judge has paid the price. It tells us in John 5.22 that judgment is left for the Son. Jesus said, God has left judgment with me. So our judge has paid our price. Isn't that cool? public reading of scripture. God's people promote good governmental authority or God's people advocate for good governmental authority. Let's read the scripture. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval. For he is God's purpose for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. An avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Before we... Uh, no, we're only going to four. I'm sorry. Uh, look at how many times the word good appears in here. It appears three times in this, se in this section. And um, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to stick with my notes so we can get through this today so I don't do what I did last week and rush you through the end. Uh, let's, go, let's look at our, our, our road map for the day, our message map. We're going to look at, can one deny that God wants government to be good? All right? Through obedience, Israel was to be an example to the nations. Do we get the Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 government God prefers or the Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 government we deserve. Romans 13, 1 through 4 does not call us to a blind obedience to sinful government. Ephesians 5, 11 says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your amazing word. We thank you for taking us who were no people and drawing us unto a people, uh, drawing us as a people unto yourself. We thank you for loving us, for caring for us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we were born in the United States of America. I think if we were born someplace else, we probably would not be able to make the connections that we've been able to make in, in Scripture. We have a long history of people uh, advocating for good government, Lord God. And uh, started with the uh, pro-testament uh, reformation, Lord. People wanting government to treat us according to the Ten Commandments. And Father, our country has gone astray from that. And uh, next week we're going to look into what do we do? Uh, how do we um, perform as Christians in a nation that... Uh, has so turned against you. We're reminded, Lord, that Paul actually wrote this scripture at a time when there was Roman persecution and when the politically appointed powers that shouldn't be were persecuting the church. So, Father, we know that you know, if we're going to do your will, there comes a time where we just have to resist or stand up to do your will despite uh, government edicts to the contrary. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the life you give us in Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Let's, let's work through this. So let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That means God has given earthly rulers authority. You know, he tells us in Scripture that he plucks up rulers and he rises up nations and he tears down nations. I believe it is... In the city of God, Augustine, he said the history of the world, after reading the book of Revelation, he said the history of the world will be that God overthrows the nations because of idol worship. So rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. God's plan is for rulers to be a terror to um, bad conduct. And God's real, real, real will is that rulers will support or approve good conduct. You have no fear of the one who is in authority by doing what is good. 
We should not fear doing what the Bible calls good. You will receive his approval, we hope. But it doesn't matter if we receive his approval or not. We're still going to do what God calls us to do. For he is God's servant for your good. See, God expects government to be good. I'm going to prove that today. Authority serves God by doing and approving what is good. I've tried to keep the fill-ins uh, on fewer per page than I, than I have in the past. I'm trying to limit them, but I had to get all this on one slide. Romans 1, uh, 13, 1, and Romans 13, 3. We're going to get to Romans 13, 2 in a, in a bit. So we see that God established civil government. In uh, Genesis 9, when Noah gets off the ark, verses 5 through 6, God says, uh, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Corporal, corporal punishment capital punishment for killing a person whoever sheds blood by humans shall their blood be shed for in the image of God has God made mankind God wants us to honor uh, us people humans as being made in the image of God so he says if you kill somebody you are going to die now what God is after actually authorizing here he's, he's setting up a system where some people are going to be in authority to administer his justice in Genesis 9, 1 through 3, after Noah gets off the ark, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves above or moves about will be food for you just as I gave you the green plants I now give you everything so the politicians that say you can't eat beef they are actually outside of God's plan for our lives and the reason I like to preach these things and make these parallels is because I believe that if you really believe that God wanted you to do something and there's some big pers powerful person in government telling you that you shouldn't do it who's more powerful that person or God who are we going to obey Genesis uh, 11, nine, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth... We're, oh, we're not going to go into that. That's not for today. Got all those fill-ins? All right. Here's a cool thing. God works to get government to be good. How do we know this? God told Abraham... In all the families or kindred or people or nations or tribes of the earth shall be blessed because of you. God told Abraham, I will bless every nation through you. Why? Because he was going to become the bloodline to the Savior. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God's plan of salvation includes discipling us, so God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For all people, tribes, and nations. Acts 10.34 and Hebrews 13.8. Acts 10.34 says this. God is no respecter of persons and he shows no favoritism or partiality. That means God treats everyone the same. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In John 3.16, the Bible says, Whosoever believes. All have sinned and all can be saved. Hebrews 13.8 tells us this, that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Now, our challenge is, do we live in Rex Lex or do we live by Lex Rex? Do we live that by Rex Lex, meaning the king is law? Or do we live under a system that God prefers whereby the law is king, Lex is Rex? God works to conform government to his will. It says three times in scripture, God says he's going to, I found like seven now, that God says he's going to judge the nations. It would be categorically unfair for God to judge that from which he separates himself. So the whole concept of separation of church and state is not accurate according to scripture. If God wanted separation of church and state, he never would have drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea when Pharaoh led his state to disobey God, right? Anyway, this is a really cool thing. You got those? Got those five words? I used to tell my high school students, when your pencils are in the air, we move on. No. All right, let's move on. Now, Israel was to be an example to the nations. Israel was supposed to be God's good guide to government. Of course, Israel disobeyed. They were never perfect in their, in their, uh, perfect in their, um, in their exemplary behavior. 
Just like America is not a perfect country because it's not, it's run by sinners. We're not perfect people. We don't, you notice that God does not overthrow or, or throw away Israel as his chosen people just because they slip up or mess up very badly. Well, the United, the founding documents that honor God in America do not get erased just because people don't um, adhere to them perfectly. Black Lives Matter wants me to be a perpetually angry, bitter, unforgiving uh, person who lives in violation to the Sermon of the Mount because of past slavery. But we went through Genesis, right? Joseph was a slave. Uh, when, when God saved the world from a famine through Joseph, God was even using the former slave to save his former masters. See, in God, there's forgiveness. We forgive and we move on. Now, this is a cool thing in Scripture. The Queen of Sheba comes to visit Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Jesus references this visit in Matthew 12, 42 and Luke eleven thirty one. 31. But let's get to the Old Testament first. Uh, Sheba is a territory in southwest Arabia. It's also the name of one of the descendants of Noah. If you look in Genesis 10, chapter, uh, 10 verse 7, uh, it says, In the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Sheba was a guy's name. Uh, and Sheba is the name of three early progenitors of tribes of, of Ethiopian descent. There's been a little bit of debate. The Queen of Sheba, was she an Ethiopian or was she from an Arabian country? Well, there's some clues in Scripture that she was from an Arabian country. Because she brings Solomon's spices. And uh, the Arabian Sheba was a, um, a center for spice production. The Ethiopian town was not. I'm not going to go into all the details there, but those of you who go online, you're going to do our messages online. The leader has all these notes and backgrounds. You can go into it as deeply as you want. Uh, but I've given it to you from some of the scholars. Anyway, okay, 1 Kings 10.1. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. What she really did is she celebrated what God was doing through Solomon. Now, Matthew 12, 42 references this visit. The Queen of Sheba will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom or divine intelligence that God had given Solomon. And Jesus says, now someone greater than Solomon. Solomon is here referring to himself, but you refuse to listen. Second Chronicles 9, 7 uh, through 8, records her saying, this is the key here. Look at what the Queen of Sheba says. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and hear thy divine intelligence. Hear what God has given you. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne to be the king for the Lord. Obviously, I'm getting this one from the KJV, right? Thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, made he, thee, or you, king over them to do judgment and justice. Israel was supposed to be an example to the nations as to what a country could be like, what a group of people could, what life could be like if you just submit yourself to God's laws. The Queen of Sheba commemorates God's wisdom manifested to Solomon in administrative affairs. If you go in and read these verses, uh, in ten, if you read 10, I think it's 1 through 4 or 1 through 3, and if you go and read this, she references a bunch of Solomon's court. She references uh, his religion. And so the Queen of Sheba commends God's wisdom manifested to Solomon in administrative affairs, court operations, prudence in religious affairs, and ethical and religious behavior or outcomes or administration. Let's move on. So, the Bible says resisting God returns judgment or reciprocates judgment. You re Do you think that God did not know that Herod was going to uh, order um, participate in the death of Jesus Christ? No. Do you think that God did not know that Pharaoh was going to resist him so he would end up drowning his army in the sea? That's not my point, though. My point is this. God called Moses. God called da King David. God called Daniel. God called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God called Paul. God called Jesus Christ. God called all the disciples to preach his word and res in resistance of government. And they all sort of pay the price for it. A lot of them did. 
I was, a lady called me up one day. She goes, my church is teaching wrong stuff. I said, why were they teaching? She said, well, they're teaching that if the disciples had obeyed the government, they would have lived longer. And I'm like, well, they got half that right. If they hadn't obeyed God, they might have lived longer. But what would your life be like? And what will, what will you face in eternity? So do we think that God does not know that America has gone off the rails? This is why he's raising up churches like this. But we are, we're, we're not, you get in touch with the heart of God, you're not so shocked that things are going on the way they are. Because I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on what does God want me to do in relation to what's going on around us? We are going to do something. Now, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists, sets, sets, sets up against, opposes what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Not the judgment of God, probably the judgment of man. But it could be eternal judgment. Bring judgment on ourselves to an adverse verdict that brings a condemnation. Expresses cause to effect. This, this phrase expresses a cause to effect um, action. That means if you do something, there's going to be a consequence. I know there's going to be a consequence for me preaching the gospel this way. I don't care. I'm still going to preach the gospel this way. The Bible doesn't change. If I, whether The black and white words on the page of the Bible don't change if I'm in China, if I'm in Colombia, if I'm in Venezuela, if I'm in Arabia, if I'm in Europe. It doesn't change if I'm in New Jersey or Texas or, or, or South Dakota. The black and white words on the page of the Bible stay the same and I don't care. As a matter of fact, what the Lord has us doing well, how do I how do I want to say this this may be incidental to our call to Christ man's judgment may be incidental in my routine expression of what God has called me to you be the man have at it but the world should realize that Pharaoh's army was drowned in a sea for opposing what God told Moses to do. Now, I do not want to see the horrors of revelation fall down on the society in which I live, so I am calling it to repentance. It's not that I'm okay and you're okay. It's that we're all lost without Jesus Christ. So whoever... Oh, here we are. Proverbs 13, 13. Whoever despises, scorns, rejects, or takes for granted, disrespects the word. Right? What does it say? The word. Whose word are we talking about? God's word. Man may try to bring this to us, but I don't care. I'm focused on God's word. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Talk to the hand, girlfriend, because the face ain't listening. All right. Whoever despises, scorns, rejects, takes for granted, and disrespects or shows contempt for the word brings destruction. That's eternal destruction. Pays the penalty through perversion and distortion that causes writhing in pain. There's some earthly consequences to ignoring God's word. I think our students in school are experiencing that. <laughs> why we're trying to get those parents mash yourselves together come to a church like liberty christian fellowship let's make a stand stop playing around with this thing kids can't fight for themselves you get here and we'll teach you the word of god and we'll stand together and fight this thing can't do it alone stop being afraid come to church let's let's get on with this they're saying we can't and i'm saying we can the bible says we can let's get on with this Let's stop skirting around the edges of this thing. Let's just throw it down on the table. Let's have at it. Evil conspires to get us to... Um, evil conspires to get us either to despise or neglect what the Bible tells us. The haters of Christianity and this expression of heaven on earth, which is what we call Western, uh, Christian Western civilization, of which America had become the pinnacle or the prime example of, are born, are withstood, believe it or not, by many of the world's religions and, com and communists. They work through subversion to undermine America's biblical value system which provided social strength and stability. So now, our way of life has grown weak and vulnerable. 
You know, there's four stages of subversion. There's demoralization, destabilization, there's crisis, and then there's a new order. The crisis is really a, a, a chaos, and the order is a new order out of chaos. You can write these down. Put, I gave you spaces in your notes, so you can write what you want. What does it mean by demoralization? Well, they want to turn morality upside down. Renee has put on our website a nine-minute segment from last week's message talking about the three steps to saturate America, which I call injecting homosexuality into our bloodstream. But they've done it with everything. They've done it with the family. They've done it with motherhood, uh, telling, telling, telling women they shouldn't be women. The Bible says you cannot ransack the home unless you first bind the strong man. So they have bound the strong man by everything, by, 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 by using the EPA to ship all the ma male jobs out of our country. Thank God they're starting to come back. I didn't realize this until 2012. I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for the first time. And I'm walking down streets and I'm looking at all the little smelting shops and welding shops and all the things that used to be in the United States of America. And I'm like, what is going on here? And the place smelled, didn't smell very good because they don't have clean, clean technology. And I thought, if this was really about the environment, why would you ship it to a poor country? If it was really about clean technology, why would you ship it there? We have clean technology. It's not about clean technology. It's about the destruction of Christianity. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the destruction of the manifestation of true Christianity on the earth. You can't do that until you, until you destroy manhood. Everything is single mom, single mom, the mom's this, the woman. No offense, ladies, but there are more women than there are men. You're not the minority. And even if you were, God does not pit us against each other for the way he has created us. This survey that they're doing is up at, in, they caught up at Saratoga High, it's been in Saratoga and other newspapers that I put on my Facebook page. This survey that, 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 that white privilege, God made you the way you are. He made me the way I am. We're not going to buy into this. And you know why they get away with it? Because there aren't enough churches teaching the application of the Bible to civics. Man grabs these, these issues under the guise of separation of church and state, and the church backs away from the issue. That's why we force ourselves to teach through the Bible. No jumping around and picking and choosing, cherry picking uh, topics that we can, so we can be politically correct. I am really, really upset about these things. I know I run around and I play the guitar and make up funny songs. I'm a man who's walking through life with my teeth clenched and my fists, my teeth gritted and my fists clenched. I know that I am at war with this, with, this, with this society. I'm at war to get the opportunity to tell more people about Christ. It is so, the war is so important that it took the life of the best man who ever lived. He's not playing games with his gospel. Yes, we do play games around the gospel. We do have fun. We have the joy of the Lord. But I assure you, I am a man who is at war. And I know I'm at war. And I'm just looking for the battle lines to be drawn so we can get on with it. I'm all suited up. And I'm ready to go. All right, so demoralization. They want to turn uh, what, what the Bible calls good upside down so it's called evil. You're not evil for being a guy. I should tell you what my... I'm not going to throw my wife under the bus here, but she saw something on Facebook last night, and she said the man that she saw, she goes, he should turn in his man card. <laughs> uh. All right, destabilization. That is the, the destruction of the application of the Bible to every sector of life, from the family to the White House, so that we can see the glorification of sin, especially sexual sin. That has directly impacted the destruction of the family. And it's also come through this whole thing. If you're a single mother, that means you're not married when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're having sex. And God does not want us having sex outside of marriage. Now, some people are single mothers because of tragedy. I used to be a veteran's advocate, so I know that people get killed and different things happen. So you become single, a single parent through, through no sinful means, so to speak. 
But it's not God's standard, and we need to quit glorifying it. I don't say we should run around and persecute people, but we certainly should be upholding God's standard for our families. The family is the building block of society. All this role reversal goes right against scripture, encouraging women to act unnaturally like men. Unconstitutional, and it's worth doing these unconstitutional, anti-biblical government agencies. Okay, I'm going to stop. What about crisis? Crisis. You know, if you create enough social disorder, there will be crisis. We've heard it said that never let a crisis go to waste, whether it's a routine snowstorm that they're going to try to turn into some global disaster through, through their inappropriate responses. And there's actually, you know, more severe crises, like real earthquakes and whatnot. Order. There's an ungodly, ungodly, their response is always going to be an ungodly, unbiblical New World Order, which people will be made to crave if they can make the crisis seem so severe that no one can stand it. You know, the communist motto was order out of chaos. If we can create enough social chaos, you'll crave order. Joseph Stalin, the architect of Russian communism, uh, who killed about 70 million people purging his society of the so-called uh, of, of so Christian and Western influence, he said this, America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold. It's patriotism, it's morality, and it's spiritual life. If we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse from within. If we can undo its patriotism, if we can sever people from the understanding that, um, that, uh, that, that all men are created equal, and we are endowed with certain inalienable rights from our Creator, if we can take away the biblical morality from our society, and if we could destroy the spiritual life, if we could destroy true Christianity. And remember, everyone who came to America was resisting government authority. Perse a, a certain church had gotten power and was persecuting the, 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 the true church, the biblical reading church in Europe. And that church is now on every corner in the United States. I tell you, I've, I've done the studies. I've seen some of the... Some of the, some of the I've, I've been in Europe and people have explained it to me there. The, the, the destruction of America has been consistent with the rise of that church. It's only now coming out. The bishops won't even talk against abortion. They're supporting, go marching down the street for homosexuality. Now we're seeing what it's really about. But will the Bible says, come out from among them. Jesus told the 70 and the 120 when he sent them to preach, he goes, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. You don't stay there. Get some guts. We've got to make a stand here. All right. Proverbs 13, 13, it says, Whoever despises the word, all those who hate what God has done in our beloved USA, they're working to get us to despise what the word of God says in its application to civics, family life, and government. Hey, let's, uh, do we have a yellow slide after this? Nope. Oh, okay, okay we're, we're coming to the yellow slide. You get those fill-ins? Yeah. Let's move on. All right, do we get... The Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 government, which God prefers to bless for obedience. He blesses the obedience with, with Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. But if you don't, you, don't, you don't adhere to his word, you want to worship idols and do all these things that God says not to do. See, we don't take idol worship that seriously, but God does. That's why it's commandment number two. God offers us in a, in a, in a, in a, an if-then proposition. He says, if you do this, I'm going to do that. In Joshua 24, 15, he says, choose, decide which way you will go. Choose this day who you will serve, who you're going to work for, who you're going to be enslaved to, who you're going to worship. We, 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 we idolize, no, we imitate that which we worship. We become like what we worship. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. He doesn't want us to be put to death or consigned to eternal misery. It's also in Matthew 18.14. Or are we going to get, are we either going to obey, are we going to choose God, or are we going to get what Deuteronomy 28.15-68 through 68 says is the type of government that people deserve when they disobey God. God is not playing games with us. He didn't write that word for no reason. That's why they work so hard to get you not to read it. 
we're going to go, I'm going to go through this in two or three, well, probably five minutes. We're going to look at this. We're going to look at 68 verses. We're going to do them in, in clumps. We're not going to do them all together. They're on, they're going to be in the yellow slide or not in your notes. But you should go home and read those because God, Jesus Christ does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you do what they did, you're going to get what they got, both positive and negative. All right, can we move on? All right, Deuteronomy verses uh, Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 6 they explain uh, the obedience and blessings that will come into your cities into your fields to your pregnancies food and provisions you do what God says you're going to have babies look what's happened in New York State no, around in, in America you don't do what God says what are they doing to these kids all right Deuteronomy 28 7 through 14 if you obey there are blessings that will come into your nation in your foreign affairs your and your in your work environment or into your environment and at work. Right? They're attacking the environment, telling us we can't, that cow, cow flatulation is bad for the environment, as if cows haven't been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. I was in a coffee shop, and there were some kids, they were uh, struggling over an assignment. And so I, I overheard, and I said, uh, what are you working on? And they said, well, we're, we're doing an assignment on the Inuit Indians and how they're killing the uh, baby seals. And I said, uh, well, well, how long have they been doing? And one of the kids said, well, if, 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 we, if we can't get that to stop, there soon will be no baby steals. So I said, well, how long have they been doing this? I mean, a couple hundred years? Oh, no, no, the kids said. A thousand years? No, 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 no. 25,000 years? Well, could be millions. Because they believe in evolution, right? right? So I said, now, wait a minute. If they've been doing this to the seals for all these thousands of years, why do you think all of a sudden all the seals are going to go away. And they said, well, our college professor told us. And I said, well, if I'm a mama seal and I'm, and, and I, and I'm nursing, and you kill my baby seal, I, my milk dries up and I go into gestation to have another seal, maybe two, maybe three. And they, one of the kids literally said, is that what's happening? Is that why they're not running out of seals? <laughs> But do you see what happens when you're taught wrong stuff? You, it is very hard to over, to un, I was with some uh, Muslims and some Christians in, uh, in Texas, and we were all talking about how difficult it is to overcome wrong information that you earn, learn earliest in your life. And from kindergarten, they've been showing these kids the weekly reader. A parent called me one day and she fed, uh, sent a clip, uh, an email clip of a weekly reader. And it has a, a, a little piece of ice and there's a polar bear on it. And if you read that article, you would think that's the last polar bear on the last piece of ice. She goes, what do I tell my kid? I said, tell your kid that if they just pan the camera back 100 feet, they would see that the ice is floating probably, you know, 20 yards from a, a, a continent of ice. <laughs> But it's very hard, difficult to overcome wrong information that you learn earliest in life. All right. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 24 says there'll be, if you disobey, you'll be cursed in your cities, you'll be cursed in your field, your wounds will be cursed, and your health will be cursed. Deuteronomy 28, 25 through 27 says if you disobey, You'll, you'll, uh, you'll be cursed to be defeated and you'll flee from your enemies. And there's a, there's, a, there's a seven time dynamic with that. It says your enemy will come one way and you'll flee seven. You'll be stricken with what appears to be boils, tumors, and scabs, and itch, which cannot be healed. Could be venereal diseases, who knows. Deuteronomy 28, uh, 20, 28 through 32, disobedience brings confusion and groping, causing you, to you can't, causing you to fail to be able to determine which direction you should go. You no longer know right or wrong. Thank God God gave us a Bible. Uh, you'll forfeit your, of your prosperity, loss of your children. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people. Um, you know, I've had men overseas tell me that your daughters are going to become one of a harem of four wives, and they're going to marry a bearded man. And I mean a man with a, they say, well, a man with a fist full of beard. Or your daughters will become the concubines that we rent for one hour a day. And they've told me there's only two types of women in Islam. You, they will be one or the other. I was in Utica doing a pro-Trump uh, free speech event, and um, a lady was uh, 
um, carrying a sign uh, pro pro Islam, and so I said to her, "Well, ma'am, you gotta you gotta walk. You, you need to walk the walk before you talk that talk." And she goes, "What are you talking about?" I, it was like eighty five degrees. Out. I said, "Why aren't you wearing a burqa?" Her husband said, "Honey, I've been thinking about that. The look she gave him." <laughs> He came as they, as they left. He whispered to me, "I'm with you, but I, I got to drive home with her." <laughs> I read Francis Schaeffer when I was in college, and I, no, he, it wasn't a sign. It's my wife and I were into Francis Schaeffer, and so we read Francis Schaeffer. Uh, the book is called "How Shall We Then Live?" Given all of this, how shall we then live? From Francis Schaeffer, I learned that perverts actually started the Enlightenment, and that's why you started seeing. Uh, you know, the, I was in London, and they got this statue of naked, naked David in the middle of the town. You drive in, there's like you know the streets, like five streets, five lanes wide. You got to look at the statue. I'm like, the Bible never says David was naked. It said he stripped down to his loincloth, but they got David naked. See, the Enlightenment was 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 evil people, Rothschild and company, paying perverts. To twist the art, to take Bible stories and twist them into a wicked direction. But they always got to start with a little bit of the good, and then they twist it to be bad. All right, where are we? Loss of your children, verse 32, your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day, but you shall be helpless. How many of us got kids that have been in college and now they're, 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 being, they're liberal a little, they're liberal and we're, pray, we're praying, our hearts are broken, right? Well, we're not going to quit praying. We, we got hope. God, God is, a, look at us. How many of us were scoffers before we came to Christ? I was. All right. Um. Look at what the schools are teaching our children. Teach, they're desensitizing them to anti-biblical religions and anti-biblical uh, moral practices. All right, let's go on to the next slide, I believe. Where are we? Deuteronomy 28, 36, oh, 34. Um, a nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and of all your labors. That's the book of Judges right there. But this is what's happening in our beloved USA as well. You can't outrun God. You can't say, oh, we were prosperous so we could do what we want to do. You can't do, you can't say, well, when I turn 18, I'm going to sin like, no. There's no age appropriate sin. There's no politically appropriate sin. So, a nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all your labors. We have these imbalanced trade deals that redistribute wealth. Think of the, think of the, uh, the deceit, the rule of thumb in the global economy is well well i learned this from jack welch he goes you know what we're gonna we're gonna move our we're, we got we're, we're moving our production overseas then we're gonna move our distribution to where our production is i knew that was never gonna work because the people overseas can't buy the stuff that we produce we're the we're the america's a standalone economy i, I do these things called re mission resources and context with people in my uh leadership programs and when we get to context they say mr wallace take america out of the world model and i say why and they say because America is a standalone economy. We have all kinds of waterfalls. We can generate power. We have wood. We have stone. We got coal. We got oil. We got natural gas. We don't need other countries. The global economy was nothing more than a legislative economy. They just made laws that said you can't do it here. You got to do it there. And I knew General Electric was going to go down the tubes because they don't make roads. Not supposed to be this, this uh, shovel ready. They're not supposed to be involved with these shovel ready products. I think their stock has gone to the floor. You can't. You uh, all right? I'm not going to go there. All right. Uh, where are we? Deuteronomy 28, 36 through 44. Disobedience will bring another nation's values shall overrule you. You'll worship idols. <coughs> Inflation will eat up your efforts, so you'll work harder to get much less. The immigrant will rise higher than you. I've had men to poke me in my chest overseas and say, you people do not know how to defend your culture. That was in 2012 and 2013. 2014, we started Liberty Christian Fellowship Church. I do know how God could defend our culture. We need to obey him. He, see, America started with the founding fathers clinging to God and, uh, and, and looking to him in prayer and reading his word and applying it to civics. We can't straighten out this country any other way. 
We've been sold in our seminaries something called, even our religious seminaries, they sold us secular reasoning. Never sat with me well, but now I understand why, why it's wrong. Secular reasoning gets you to disobey in the name of some earth man-made man cause or man-made uh, uh, philosophy. You, I don't care how many robes your council wears. I don't care how many accoutrements they have of religion. You don't obey God's word, you, you're going to get what, what, what these verses are talking about. You can't play games with God. He's not, he, he, he wrote the Bible. People got burned at the stake for printing the Bible. They never stopped. Because the Holy Spirit is in the Bible and he's driving us to get his word out to the hands of other people. So if, 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 why, why do they only attack the Bible? Because it's the truth. So, Deuteronomy 28, 45 through 51. It's proverbial. You, this, this, it's the proverbial eating you out of house and home. You will serve an enemy nation that will swoop down like the eagle, rapidly overtake the land. They won't speak your language. Press 2 for English, uh, for Spanish. They will be from a harsh culture and be a hard-faced people who won't respect the old nor show our mercy to the young. Just go Google immigration, rapes, and riots in Europe on YouTube. Deuteronomy 28, 52 through 57. The most civil will crash in the crisis and do terrible things to each other. Maybe eat your children if you're that hungry. We don't have to let that happen to us. It shouldn't happen on our shift, right? We can do better than that. All we got to do is obey. Let's go on. I think I have one more slide on this. So Deuteronomy 28, 58 through 63. If you obey, we get blessed. But disobedience will be accompanied by extraordinary afflictions that dramatically will decrease the population. Yeah, zero, Europe is at zero pop, is, is below population growth, and America is just about at zero. Meanwhile, the enemies, four wives, 20 kids. Uh, if we disobey, verses uh, 64 through 68, we get scattered to be terrorized by those who worship demons and idols, and who, as a result, reflect incredible torture and terror on their captives. Make a thought, you get a feeling. If you feel that way long enough, you will act on it. All right, let's move on. The history of people craving the freedom to read and respond and live what the Bible says, which always compels them to work to get government to treat we the people according to the Ten Commandments. The Reformation rekindled the application of the Bible to civics. You know, the, the, we weren't, I, don't, I don't call myself a Protestant. I'm not protesting anything. I'm, I'm pro-testament. I just want to live what the Bible says. I don't have the Bible in isolation. I see that the Bible tells me the same things from Genesis to Revelation. Hey, look at this. I didn't put these in your notes, but you, you got, you've got the, I've given you this before. That's why they're in black now, because we've done some of this before. Um, and, uh, but I'm, but I'm, going to, I'm going to add to it. There's a guy in there that we haven't talked about before. All right, Wycliffe, 1320 to 1384, he believed that there were divine laws that all must obey. He said the Bible, in the foreword of his Bible, 1382 Bible, he wrote the, gov the Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Abraham Lincoln was quoting this Bible from which Abraham Lincoln learned to read. Abraham Lincoln was quoting John Wycliffe when he made the, um, uh, the Gettysburg Address. John Huss comes along. Notice the dates, okay? John Huss comes along. His, the name means goose. When they burned him at the stake for doing what he did, he said, you may cook this Huss. But I have thousands of students who are never going to stop the march of scripture. Um, he, in 1394, as a Czech student, he preached against indulgences. Students rioted, and the Catholic and government authorities wanting the freedoms, the, uh, the Catholic, they rioted against the Catholic and the government authorities wanting, they, they rioted against them because they wanted the freedom scripture states. Huss was burned at the stake. And uh, in 1450, Martin Luther comes along. He escapes burning because the Muslims had attacked Constantinople and the, and the um, German princes made a deal. We'll go help you fight, but you leave this guy alone. And uh, he burned his papal edict. Uh, ordered, they ordered him to recant. He did a public burning and he, what, he reignited what, what Wycliffe has started. As a matter of fact, they accused him of being a Huss and a Wycliffe. Next, go to the next slide. What I really want to do, right, we, just, we never did Tyndale, but I'm not going to do him tonight, today, but we're going to talk about Montesquieu. Now, William Tyndale, he was born uh, right about the time of um, um, the Spanish Inquisition. And so, but the thing that uh, was, was also coming onto the scene was the Gutenberg printing press. 
And so his word got, you know that when, when, when Tyndale, um, when they wrote the King James Version of the Bible, 80% of it are the words of Tyndale. 80 to 90% of the King James Bible came from this guy. And he got burned at the stake. Well, they actually put him on a cross and choked him to death, then they burned the cross. Let it not make thee despair, neither yet discourage thee, O reader, that it, that it is forbidden thee in pain of life and goods, or that it is made breaking of the king's peace. Or you preach the Bible, you're breaking the king's peace. Or a treason unto his highness. You, 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 t you tell people that God is king and I'm not king, you're going to get it. Uh, to read the word of thy soul's health. For if God be on our side, what matter maketh it who be against us, be they bishops, cardinals, or popes? Montesquieu wrote in the Spirit of the Laws in 1748, Book 24, that society must repose on unchanging principles or, 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 or on principles that do not change. James Madison said in 1778, we have staked the whole future of American civilization upon the capacity of each and all of us to self-govern or govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments, laws that don't change by God. Let's move on. These are different uh, types of governments, which we're not going to go into today. I'm going to bring this back to, uh, next week. I got another slide besides this next week. Let's move on. All right. In 1776, America's founding fathers declared or the, and codified God's will for good government to secure the inalienable rights he gives we the people. He said, they said in the Declaration of Independence, God gives us our rights. No government or ruler. I don't care if it's Ecclesiastes. Look at all the, look at the Southern Baptist Convention, all these people, American Baptist uh, um, um, authorizing homosexual pr uh, pastors and whatnot. No government ruler, secular or ecclesiastical, can take them away. Government's role is to honor and cooperate with God to secure the biblical rights God gives us. If you believe that, you will not be afraid of people. You will go get your rights. And that's the rebellion I'm trying to spark. That's the reformation I want to spark. You cling to God and get your rights. All right. So, God does not call us to a blind obedience to government. Isaiah 59, 14 through 16. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a, at a, at a, at a distance. Truth is stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. You want to do God's will, they come after you. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Onto the scene comes Liberty Christian Fellowship Church. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. If you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. Caring for the poor is providing them with the opportunity to pursue life, liberty and happiness. Not abusing government power by redistributing wealth. We don't want government theft in the name of helping the poor. See? People play around. We, 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 we got to be very specific on, about the Word of God. All right. Foreigners are wronged when they are encouraged to sin against God in sanctuary cities that allow them to shed innocent blood. Let me end this. God loves people. Each generation can be a born-again generation of 2 Chronicles 7.14 people. Those who are called by, by names, generally we're called Christians in Christ. We apply the Bible to every aspect of life, including civics. That's the only way to fulfill 2 Chronicles 7.14. All of our churches, though, well, most of our churches have organized under a concept called separation of church and state. So they, they actually organize saying, we will not apply the Bible to every aspect of life. That's been the deception. Born again people, John 3, 3 through 16, are children of God who live as direct disciples. We're not stepchildren of a church. Disciples of Christ have a personal relationship with God through Bible reading. I come in the volume of the book. I come in the volume of the book. My word will never return void. 
it will it will do what what I've purposed it to do. You read it, and you will get your heart full of God, and you will get your you get you don't even know what the Holy Spirit's like till you start reading the Bible. Then you'll sense what the Holy Spirit's in and what the Holy Spirit convicts against, what the Holy Holy Spirit motivates, and what the Holy Spirit convicts against. Prayer. It fulfills Second Chronicles seven fourteen by humbling ourselves and seeking God's face. You see, God says, "Seek my face." Don't don't be go praying to some statue. And you, Jesus said, whatever you do in my name, I will do for you. He, you can't do it in anybody else's name. Matthew 6, 7 and 1 Timothy 1, 6 says, turn, it's turning from your wicked ways. Assembling ourselves to fellowship with other believers who are also applying the Bible to every aspect of life, including our civics. God is not separating himself from any part of his creation You have no feelings for the next couple of slides, but I'm going to go through them very quickly. Take your time. Do you find this meaningful? Or am I some kind of crackpot sitting up here? That too. <laughs> we, we, it could be more than one. <laughs> If God, God offers us an if-then proposition, an if-then option, you don't have to take it. You, if, you do the if, if you don't do the if, you don't get the then. Um, in Chronicles 7.14, he says, if my people, let's move on through this slide, I, because I'm, I'm, I got it unpacked here. He says, if we do four things, he'll do three. He goes, if we humble ourselves, see yourself as God sees you, believe what the Bible says about us. He didn't write it for any reason. He didn't have, he didn't, he, not, he rose up Israel as a nation to protect his word. He had people burned at the stake for his word. The Holy Spirit's in that. You, you know, the, there, there are historical records of John Wycliffe being burned at the stake, and they're talking about how calm he was. God is not giving us dying grace to get his word out because his word is not important. His word is super important. Pray. Speak with God and let God speak to you. Seek God's face. Seek a relationship with him. Love him and his word, not just what blessings come from his hand. Turn from our wicked ways. Repent. Do 180 degree about face towards God. We don't have to get to Deuteronomy 28, um, 15 through 68. We can get the 1 through 14. It's an if-then proposition. Actually, I don't, I don't have it in this. I'm gonna, maybe I'll put it in next week. But in Jeremiah, God says, if I've put, planned um, evil for a nation, harm for a nation, and that nation turns, I will relent of what I plan to do. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, no man knows the hour or the day. Can we have the next slide? No man knows the hour or the day. Um, and, and the reason for that is because God gives us an if-then proposition. He goes, if you do your ifs, I'll do my then. I will hear. I will forgive. I'll heal your land. I had a guy on Facebook last night said, America's going to get what's coming to it. I'm like, that's love. <laughs> I don't want that to happen to people around me. Even the, one even the ones opposing us. I want to see them repent. I want to see all come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The faith comes by and what must be heard? The word of God. God. John 3, 3, Jan Jesus answered um, uh, Nicodemus and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We have to be born again. I spent two months studying this. And I've come to the conclusion it's mystical. I cannot get my hands around. I cannot define what it means to be born again. I dug into all the scriptures I could think of. Now, some of you I know will come to me afterwards. You'll give me some more work to do. That would be good. Maybe I could figure it out. But it's a mystical thing. I can't explain it. I just know that it happens. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is a whosoever? This is a special person? A person with a particular type of degree. No. What about a particularly wicked sinner who broke all the Ten Commandments? Or sinners like us who only have broken maybe seven, eight. <laughs> First John 1 John 1.9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Read the word. The whole, there's, a mystery, the mystery is, there's a mystery called the mystery of godliness. The black and white words on the page connect with our spirits and they transform our thinking. They take us who were no people and they draw us unto God 
and he, he unites us together as a people. Amen? Amen? Is that the last slide? Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Father, my heart is broken, but it's also very encouraging. encouraged. My heart is broken for the lost. My heart is broken for our schools. My heart is broken for what's happened to families and women and children in our society and men. But Lord, my heart is also encouraged that you are a great and awesome God and Savior. That you pursue mockers like, like we once were. And you change our hearts. You take us who were no people, you draw us unto yourself and you make us a people unto you. And we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we pray that the burdens that you're giving us that you would fulfill. That you would use us to reach this generation, God. That you would draw young people to us, Father, where they can learn from the wisdom of our years. That you would set us free, Father, so that when we read your word, we're not confined by our past, what we've learned in our past. It could be good. It could be good information. But we don't want that holding us back from looking at every portion of Scripture and just asking God, why did you include this in your Bible? What does it inform us about who you are? What does it inform us about who we are? And, 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 and important for, more importantly for us, what does it inform us about what we're going to be in relation to who you are? We thank you for your amazing word. Lord, I thank you for all the people throughout history, going back to, to Noel, going back to Adam, through whom you have worked to bring us to where we are today, Lord. Thank you, Father. We love you. And all God's people said. Amen. And then they said,